Good morning and welcome everybody. I have just after 9 on my clock here, so I think we'll get started. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, so first of all, welcome. I know that, that probably this might be the first time for some of you using this type of technology to join a meeting like this. Uh, so we're excited that you took the chance and, and came on and took the time to join us this morning. Uh, just some quick introductions. My name is Sarah Webster and uh, I'm a consultant with Gestalt Collective, a knowledge translation uh, consultancy. Uh, but right now, uh, for the next few months, I am also a knowledge broker with uh, Niagara Connects, the network that's hosting uh, this meeting today. So I'm happy to be on with you and happy to see so many uh, familiar names definitely on the phone today. We've also got two other presenters with us today who I'm sure you'll be very familiar with. Uh, Mary Wiley, our Executive Director with Niagara Connects, um, and Catherine Mindorf, past Chair and Senior Associate with the network as well. So we're happy to have you on today and uh, we'll, we'll keep it pretty casual but we do have a lot to cover. For those that this is a new technology, um, you know, I just wanted to give you a bit of an orientation to how this works. Uh, you'll certainly hear my voice through the phone line and then you'll also be able to see the slides on your screen. So do make sure that you've also clicked on that, that meeting room link that was included in the connection details. Uh, and that'll let you be able to see the slides as we walk through the presentation. As well on the left hand side of your screen, um, there's a column labeled chat. You're welcome to type any questions in there or comments during the, the time we have together today. And I'll keep an eye on those. They can either be tech related or if you have any specific questions uh, for our presenters as, as we go through the presentation, you can type them there. For now, all participant lines are muted. Um, we know that we have some groups joining us um, and we've actually got some, some practice talk leaders that are hosting groups joining us today. I think that there's actually a big group out in Port Colborne. Um, so by muting all the participant lines, this then helps us cut down on some of that background noise because we really do want you to be able to have those background conversations in your groups, um, but this way you can do so without interrupting the presentation itself. In addition, this um, webinar is also being recorded right now and we'll make the recording available online uh, shortly within a week or so and we'll let you know when that's available and how to access it. And we'll also make sure that the slides are available um, for you at that time as well. So um, we will get those out to you too because I know that that's always a hot question in these type of uh, presentations. So other than that, our objectives today uh, for the Rowing the Boat Together webinar are, are three things. We're going to introduce a model for interagency collaboration um, and walk through what that model looks like. We'll build some momentum for practice talk around Niagara uh, and then we'll prepare, get ourselves set up for the April 17th Rowing the Boat Together Forum. Um, that's an in-person forum, an in-person event that will be happening um, in Welland and we'll give you some more information about that at the end of this presentation or at the end of this call. Um, and then uh, we'll also be sending out an invitation for that to each of you uh, later on today. So you'll see that coming too. So in terms of the flow today, we'll uh, hear from Mary, Catherine and myself um, through the presentation for about 40 minutes or so and then uh, we'll open it up for some questions from you and some conversation with you. So at that time, We'll uh, let you know how you can either type questions into the chat pod or else verbally um, unmute your phone and verbally ask questions that way. So I think that's all for me. I'm uh, going to get us on to the next slide here and turn it over to Mary. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so exciting to hear everyone um, coming online here with us. And uh, um, for all of us who are, this is uh, maybe our first or second time on a webinar, it's a way to learn together and one that we can uh, become more comfortable with over time. So what we're doing, uh, as Sarah said, is taking a look at uh, the work we've already done together and how it can inform um, our work going forward through uh, the Rowing the Boat Together project. So the idea of interagency collaboration Niagara-wide geared to client success is one that we've already, um, there's been hundreds of people involved in doing the background work on it. So just to take a little review of all that work, um, the putting the pieces together sessions that began in 2008 
in Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, and then in 2012, they uh, spread out Niagara wide with sessions being held in Port Colburn, Welland, St. Catharines, and West Niagara um, provided a really good start. Um, as well, the Niagara Prosperity Initiative held a, a series of community conversations and they prepared a report based on those conversations. That work was done in 2009 and that included the voices of community leaders, so people with lived experience who could uh, inform um, this work. The social assistance review um, that happened provincially in 2011, there were literally hundreds of people, I think the estimate was four or five hundred people in Niagara who participated in that process, uh, first by putting thoughts together, um, going in and making presentations to the social assistance commissioners when they were down in Niagara, and also by responding to the uh, reports, the versions of the reports that the commissioners put out. And um, that included both uh, people working in agencies delivering services, but also people receiving services. The Niagara Poverty Reduction Network, uh, the collaboration subcommittee of that group is the reference group for the Rowing the Boat Together project. And the Poverty Reduction Network includes about 30 agencies that gather around the table uh, once a month as a whole group and then there's a lot of committee work uh, going on. And definitely advocacy is a, a major goal with this idea of interagency collaboration uh, for client success being one of the core pieces of work that that group wishes to achieve. Our practice talk leaders, which we'll refer to a little bit more later on in this slide, um, there are 10 frontline workers from around Niagara from a variety of agencies and they've stepped up to the plate to help lead um, our learning in the process of practice talk. As well, more recently, the Niagara Region Housing and Homelessness Strategy, um, the work that was done in the fall and then through the winter um, by a number of agencies, I think there were 100 groups that uh, were represented at the meeting in January that some of you will have been at. Priority number six that came out from that work was, again, an emphasis on interagency collaboration um, to address um, housing and homelessness in Niagara. And then, of course, through the Rowing the Boat Together project, frontline community service workers gathered in both October and November of 2012 to take a look at the practice talk process and learn about it and then to practice it a bit. Um, we built some momentum and we have some ideas for ways to build more. And then the executive directors and managers from uh, community service agencies gathered in January in Niagara Falls and their work um, and exchange of information is reflected in the presentations today. So from all of that work, literally by hundreds of people, and I think all of you who are on the call will have had some hand in at least some or all of that work, common themes that, themes that emerged were um, four major ones. And the first one is working together as a Niagara-wide network. So we repeatedly heard that yes, we would like to collaborate as a Niagara-wide network and we'd like to collaborate on an interagency basis. We'd like to wrap around clients and meet their needs um, geared toward client success. And we'd like to share knowledge, information, and value each other's strengths. The second theme is facilitate learning and knowledge sharing opportunities. And this refers to both in-person and virtual work such as we're doing during this hour right now. So the ideas there were to build the practice talk momentum, um, share ideas about burning issues, and also rotate a spotlight on agencies' assets so that we can learn about um, how we can share um, in each other's strengths. The third theme is to advance a person-centered community service model geared to client success. And um, that would be by collaboratively discussing and agreeing on best practices in the Niagara context. 
again, with that goal of um, client success. And engaging people at all levels in a Niagara-wide community service delivery network is the fourth um, theme. And that idea is to um, integrate the learning for members um, at all levels in the continuum of community service delivery. And we'll talk a little bit more about, expand on these themes in the next few slides. So taking a look now at a model to organize our work. Um, if you uh, look at these circles here, the one in the, the center is delivery. So that's that person-centered delivery. That's our core objective that has emerged from those themes from our work. And there's three elements that support that goal that we've agreed on as being very important. And those are um, some tools, some proven tools to inform our work, help us do our work, um, people, engage knowledgeable people, and the idea of impact, the collective impact that we can have by working together in a strategic way. So the delivery that's at the core, that core theme um, in the model, is collaboration for person-centered community service delivery in Niagara leading to client success. And the tools. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the tools. Uh, these next couple of slides are about them. So the idea is to strengthen interagency collaboration. There are some proven tools that we can use um, to inform that work to help us to achieve uh, the goals that we set together. One is practice talk, which we've already learned a bit about. And uh, communities of practice, Sarah is going to be talking a little about, a bit about communities of practice and knowledge exchange. Those two tools, um, actually all three work very closely together, the first three, the practice talk, communities of practice, and knowledge exchange. And then network mapping and analysis, and that's something that um, Catherine is going to be talking about in some upcoming slides in a few minutes. So practice talk is a process. And it is designed to um, help us share practice stories. So it's for frontline workers to share practice stories. And the process helps that conversation to um, evolve into how can we do this better. And by sharing those ideas, amongst ourselves, then we can come up with um, some best practices that will inform our work. This process works best when it's based on trusted relationships. And on that note, I believe uh, we have that, a group down in Port Colburn. There's some folks from Port Cares and Bridges Community Health Center and perhaps some others in the room um, who I believe are going to um, try doing a practice talk, a brief practice talk session after uh, the webinar today. So we'd like to thank them for taking the leadership um, on that front. And as well, best practice ideas emerge. Participants, that's how they take value back to their workplace from um, uh, the work of practice talk. And then the whole, the, really the whole goal is through that interaction, it helps the, the teams, the people that gather together, to be more cohesive, to um, achieve that integration, and it can lead to organizational change and increased productivity. So here's the list of the practice talk leaders. You can see they're located all around Niagara from a range of agencies. And um, they have done a little extra learning on practice talk, but the idea is then to um, pass that learning along, and there's opportunities for all of us to be involved in these sessions if we wish to do so. So on that note, um, we have uh, the, the group decided that uh, they wanted to issue a practice talk challenge with a goal of two practice talk sessions being held in all areas of, Ni of Niagara between today and June 8th. So over the next couple of months, 
And um, if you'd like any support in um, rising to the challenge, by all means, uh, let us know. Um, you can email us. Our email address is info at niagaraconnects.ca and we can help to connect you up with one of the practice talk leaders. Um, we'll also be checking back in on this um, in two weeks at the Niagara-wide forum for the Rowing the Boat Together project. So Sarah's going to talk a little bit about communities of practice. Perfect. Thanks, Mary. So communities of practice are, they're really groups of people who've made a commitment to be available to each other, um, who have an interest in the same topic. They come together um, because they have a passion in a specific topic. And they come together to share learning with each other, uh, to develop new knowledge together, to share discoveries, and really to advance both individual practice as well as organizational or um, collective practice. So communities of practice are different than project groups in that members of communities of practice, or COPs, um, they self-select. So they're not directed by a manager to sit on a specific committee with the task of completing a set amount of work or, or a project, seeing a project through to completion. Um, instead, they self-select and they join the group because of a, a common interest. And they're then held together by that passion. Um, and because as individuals, they uh, individuals identify with the group work that's being done. Um, so the output of a community practice can be very different. We see some communities of practice um, for example, I worked with a, a group through the Alzheimer Knowledge Exchange that was um, interested in design and dementia, how our environment um, affects dementia and how we can change the way that the environment is set up in terms of um, doorways or noise or lighting to, to better impact the individual living with dementia. Um, so that group actually came together and developed a set of evidence-based knowledge to practice like recommendations, that, tools that could be used. Um, by long-term care facilities and other care settings. However, other communities of practice um, might be more focused on changing policy, um, coming together collectively to then impact or change policy, or to identify problems or issues in the system um, that need to be addressed. And sometimes part of coming together as a, as a community of practice is, is developing that network of people that you can draw on and, and call um, to further advance your own work individually as well. So in Niagara Region, I believe that there's actually just starting um, the development of an at-risk youth community of practice. Um, so that's coming. So this is, we anticipate that this idea and this concept around a community of practice might be a way for this group um, through, through what's been done with Rowing the Boat Together, or even subgroups within Rowing the Boat Together, um, to work together going forward. So uh, it, it really is a unique, a unique concept. And, and I can tell you firsthand from just my experience with different groups that, that the, the rewards are quite um, powerful because there is that common commitment of groups or of individuals to the group. With respect to knowledge exchange, um, Niagara Connects, which is, was formerly the Niagara Research and Planning Council, um, is, the network that, is a network that supports collaboration, planning, learning, innovation, and community action in Niagara. Um, when appropriate, the network uses technology, such as, as what we're using today, the webinar platform today. Um, to help bring people together to engage in meaningful and deliberate dialogue or exchange. Um, one product of Niagara Connects is the Niagara Knowledge Exchange, or the NKE. Um, and the NKE leverages the, the Niagara Connects community of partners that's out there. Um, it's enabled by a knowledge broker such as myself. Um, and my job is to connect people to people or people to resources that will help you do your work better. Um, and uh, also driven by opportunities to exchange, such as what's happening today. And then finally, an online platform. Um, and that online platform will be launching late spring and will help then connect people to resources, um, events, projects, 
that are happening in the Niagara community across all 12 sectors outlined in the Living in Niagara report. Um, with the intention to better enable the community to better access um, relevant information, as well as identify opportunities for collabor collaboration and uh, community action together. So we're pretty excited about that, and uh, I know Mary, Kath, and myself, we've seen some of the, what that might look like, some of the design prototypes, and uh, pretty excited about when that will, will be able to be launched late in the spring, um, and we'll certainly be in touch with you as that comes out. I'll turn it back over to Catherine to talk to us a little bit then about network mapping and analysis. Thank you, Sarah. This uh, network mapping and analysis is something we discovered about a year ago, and some of you have already uh, seen some of our the maps, the preliminary maps that we've done. This is one of the tools in the package that will help us. It'll uh, help us work together as we um, we work through this network of people together to. Uh, uh, advance the rowing the boat together. So it, it, um, this will show you the, the original maps that we had are very sparse. These maps actually, this map here in front of you is actually a very healthy community. The reason it's a very healthy community is because each of those little dots is either a person or a organization of people and they're talking to each, each other so that you can see the relationship between one dot and another. Those dots actually tell you that person A and person B actually talk to each other. As we grow in our interagency collaboration and our working together in our community of practice, you will see that our map, our map will become much more dense, will become denser. That becomes a healthier community. The, um, so the way that we get these dots, is, and some of you have done this, if you fill out a little uh, survey, and that survey tells us who you've talked to about your work in the last five or six weeks. And um, do you think that they are somebody you would like to work with, somebody that you would uh, either admire or think they know something or kind of have an opinion that you uh, would value? And that goes in, in this map. And that's how we build it. In a year's time, we'll build our other map, our second map, and you will see how much work we've done and the successes that we've done to pull ourselves together on this common idea of uh, working together. When you look at this map and you look at the outskirts of it or the peripheral part of it, you see some other little clusters of people working together. This is a very important part of our map. So if we just had the center of the map, that tells us in that thicker cluster of people that we trust each other that we um, have easy communication with each other. It tells us um, that we can mobilize very quickly to get something done and that we share uh, information, almost like a, a gossip column kind of thing, very, very quickly. And on the outside are people in the periphery of our life whom we're connected to in some way, and you can see that, where they bring in new knowledge, new ideas, different ways of doing things, and we need them both. If we just had the center of the map where we're all together and we trust each other and we work together, we're doing the same thing we always do and we'll get the same product we always do. So in order to stimulate us to grow, we really need the outside connections. So what that means is if we're uh, all working together in Niagara, we might connect with some people from York Region or from Waterloo or from Toronto or Timbuktu, it doesn't matter. And they might, in some kind of way, like a forum or a conference or just uh, in personal relationships, enable us to see things a little bit differently and perhaps we could try those things. So the map, why we're excited about the map, and we just met with the fellow Dan who's joined us. He's our research associate. He's on the uh, webinar today with us. He's excited us to see all kinds of possibilities for mapping that will give us a lot of information about ourselves. It will tell us, in fact, who are the real leaders and who are the people that we respect the most in terms of uh, moving us forward or supporting us? So exciting knowledge, exciting information for us, and we're looking forward to building these maps. Thank you. So um, let's just go. That's okay. So maybe we could uh, turn it back over to Mary to talk to us then about the the third component of our model um, being engaged, knowledgeable people. 
Okay, so um, this is that um, uh, a second uh, element of the model that we are suggesting could work to help us uh, move forward. And um, in a few moments, you'll, we'll actually be opening it up for discussion to get your reaction to the, the model and these ideas that we were providing. And I know we're providing lots of information, but this is sort of um, a bit of a prelude to the uh, uh, forum in two weeks that will um, help us to um, uh, sort of, it turbocharges our work two weeks from today <laughs> at the forum. So, uh, what we mean by engaged, knowledgeable people is um, having people at all levels in our continuum of work um, understanding the work that we'd like to do going forward. So that, that ranges everywhere from clients to our frontline workers to our executive directors and managers with the agencies, board members as well, so that it um, helps them to make more informed decisions or informed in how we're working together, um, Niagara Region government leaders, and then funders. And by funders, we mean groups like United Way, Niagara Community Foundation, um, or any number of other groups that might um, fall under that description. So the reason that we want to be engaged and knowledgeable as a network of people is that um, that helps us to collaborate, to build our skill base, um, to educate ourselves about benefits of working together in a, some new and different ways, and again, to engage people at all levels uh, within our continuum. And then the final circle or element that supports that um, uh, core uh, goal of um, interagency collaboration for community service delivery that is person-centered, is the idea of achieving collective impact. What can we achieve by working together? And how can we set that up in a, a framework that makes sense? There's been some wonderful research done at Stanford University, again, a proven model um, to help guide our work. And um, it is based on uh, five elements. Um, so all successive, successful collective impact um, uh, initiatives share five common elements, and those are described as, and we'll show you some concrete examples in a moment, a common agenda, shared ways of measuring, setting goals and measuring how we achieve those goals, or maybe if we need to alter our course slightly based on uh, what our outcomes are, mutually reinforcing activities so that we're um, helping each other out to move forward, continuous communication, and that's where the knowledge exchange um, will come in as a great uh, tool, for example, and a backbone support organization to um, help the group keep moving forward. So um, collective impact, um, this is what the researchers from Stanford um, describe it as. It is the commitment of a group of important actors from different sectors to a common agenda for solving a specific social problem or challenge. So in our case, it's Niagara-wide interagency collaboration for a best practice model of person-centered community service delivery. And if we take a look at this little table here, um, some of the themes and ideas that arose from our work together um, really do align with the collective impact model. So if we think of um, person-centered system of service delivery for client success, that is actually, that would, could be called our collect common agenda. Um, we could agree on goals and how to measure progress, and that would be our shared measurement system. Um, some ideas that came up um, for mutually reinforcing activities were things like exploring cross-training of frontline staff and perhaps taking a look at centralized intake with the idea of there being uh, no door is the wrong door sort of thing. Um, and sharing ideas through practice talk, the knowledge exchange is that 
continuous communication. And then the work, uh, for example, that Niagara Connect is doing right now facilitating the Rowing the Boat Together project with that funding support from the Niagara Prosperity Initiative is an example of the work of a back home support organization just to illustrate the concept. So now, I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Perfect. Thank you, Mary. So I, this is great. It's exciting stuff that's happening. And certainly, Mary has outlined what has got us here today um, and, and presented this, this model for how we can think about our work together going forward. Um, before we actually get to the discussion questions, I'd like to pause um, and ask if anyone has any questions related to the concepts that we've talked about today, network mapping, um, knowledge exchange, communities of practice, practice talk, collective impact. These are all they're pretty conceptual um, topics, and, and the intention today is really just to introduce them um, into our language, into our vocabulary, so that we can start considering them in a little bit more of a deliberate way going forward. But does anyone have any questions specifically about any of those concepts before we get into the discussion? And you're welcome to either um, type questions into the chat pod or else unmute your phone line by pressing star 7 and then verbally ask questions over the phone. So I'll just pause for a second. Hello? Hi. Hi, it's Rick Merritt from the Niagara Community Foundation. Hi, Rick. Yep. Um, I, I, I was wondering, sometimes I need to hear things twice or maybe even three times before I get them. Mm -hmm. And on the, the, the mapping and network that Catherine was speaking about, yes. I need to, sometimes visual things help me. Would that, would that start like on a community by community basis and then be overlaid as, and become like a regional map or document? Would that be the plan? Can I answer that, Sarah? Please do, yes, Catherine. Hi, Rick. Um, Hi. That is actually the goal of our whole community. Would that would be a wonderful goal? It's um, what you you know how we set up the Living in Niagara report, Rick, with the twelve different sectors. Yeah. And you know how we have the knowledge exchange is going to have twelve different rooms in it, so to speak. Uh -huh. Well, each of those will be arts and culture, health, those kinds of things. The really beautiful thing that we could do is to take maps of everybody working in each of those sectors and then superimposing it all on the same map. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking if there was a, a community of practice, say, operating in Fort Erie and Port Colburn, and somebody in Grimsby happened to look at it and see it, then they would know immediately they could get in touch with the people in Fort Erie and Port Colburn and you know see how they're doing it and maybe replicate some of the best things of it. Yes, exactly, Rick. And the idea is, you don't need to do this two or three times, you got it. But the idea is that um, the knowledge broker from the knowledge exchange would be aware of that right away. So Sam from Grimsby and Susie Q from Fort Erie would be connected as soon as that happens by the knowledge broker. So we even okay. have even stronger things happening for us. Yeah. Great, thank you. Sarah, I was just going to say that the map may show us where we have gaps in communication too, which then just allows us to connect with the person uh, that you know that in your own relationship with the person. You would say, gee, this is all going on in uh, Niagara Falls. We should really talk to the people in St. Catharines because they're doing the same thing, and then we connect. So it's the same idea. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Mary, you might be better to answer this one. Diane has asked uh, through the chat pod, will the practice talk facilitators be given time by their host agency to come out and host a session at another agency? That's so I think, think I noticed that question, and that's a really good question. I think that's something that we can address sort of on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, the idea was that the practice talk leaders would, would help um, to lead their peers in better understanding the process, and it's something we're, we're all uh, learning together. Um, we would like to work with the executive directors and managers at the agencies to um, encourage that opportunity to be provided. And um, 
I think it's something where we can work together to help people pull those practice talk sessions together. So um, while I cannot uh, personally speak for all 10 of those practice talk leaders or any one of them at any one time because at the end of the day they work for their own agency, there is uh, I think a collective will to um, help each other to understand how to get a practice talk session going. So, um, and we will talk a little bit more about that on, at the forum in two weeks um, on the 17th of April. So one way or another, we'll help any groups who want to get a practice talk session going and haven't been exposed to the information already. Um, and we'll, I'm sure, make a personal commitment. Catherine and I are sitting here nodding at each other. Yes, we'll help you to make it happen um, and provide you with the tools to get you started. I think you'll see fairly quickly that it all makes a lot of sense, is very practical, and before you know it, you'll be up and running um, hosting your own practice talk sessions wherever you'd like to do that. Perfect. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions about the concepts that we've talked about today? So does, does this model that we've presented um, and that interplay between the tools um, and the people and then the, the collective impact to all contributing to this person-centered delivery, um, does that model make sense to people? Um, and if so, what are some of the challenges that you see in moving forward with that and what needs to happen to help us achieve those goals? And just a reminder that if you are on mute, you can unmute your phone line by pressing star 7. Oh, there's a good question, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Erin. So Erin has asked a question, um, what is the forum that's being talked about and how can we participate in it? I will put up a slide just after the discussion with all the details laid out. Um, but just to give you a bit of sense, it is a forum um, where we'll be looking forward. Actually, I can put it up right now for a second. Um, where we'll be looking at charting our course for change and steps that we can take together. So it's an in-person opportunity in Welland um, on April 17th. And we will be hearing a presentation as well from Chris Ack Ackley um, about person-centered thinking in Niagara, which we're really excited about. So, the invitation for that event will be sent out later today to everyone who received the invitation for this event. So you will get more information about it later today. And I hope that, uh, that everyone on the call will consider and, and be available um, to join that next conversation as well. As you said that in, in terms of, I'm interpreting here that in terms of um, what needs to happen to achieve, to achieve our goal, time to think and execute. Uh, and, and that's a great point, that often it, it's easy to barrel ahead, <laughs> I'll say barrel, um, but that we also need the time, the dedicated time um, and protected time to think these type of concepts through and, and how we can do it in the most um, effective way that engages our community in the most effective way as well. And Kelly, you, Kelly also um, concurred with that, time is the thing in shortest supply. It's extremely hard to keep up with the daily flow, certainly. Sarah, can I make a comment? It's Catherine. Please, yes. Um, one of the things I've learned in working with people uh, in the community at all different spots uh, on the continuum is that sometimes we're kind of hard on ourselves. We try to get up and running right on the spot, mostly because a lot of our projects are driven by the beginning, the end, and the middle is so collapsed. We just need to get it finished. And I think if we keep the perspective that this is going to take two to three years to become na a natural flow in our work, uh, I've learned this because um, I worked with infection control nurses over 10 years. And at first we didn't talk to each other and we were always solving the same problems. And over a period of the, of the first five years, we came together as a group. We didn't have technology, so we made a point of meeting. It was very, very hard because there was usually only one nurse to hospital. You can't get away very well. But we made a point of doing it. And over a period of five to six years, we had a phenomenal uh, group going forward. And it made a big difference, and our managers saw it as well. That's a great point, Catherine. And also, um, I would add to that, too, that we have to start with where the readiness is. Um, 
that just like when you talked about the network mapping, um, really shows where people are already talking. Um, we need to we need to go there and start those conversations. In addition to identifying where there might be gaps that we can then start to build those relationships. Um, but with all of our work, look at starting with, I guess, the low hanging fruit with the easiest wins um, to then help us gain that momentum moving forward. Um, so that in the long term, in two to three years, we will see the successful implementation of this type of model. Um, Sarah. Could mm -hmm. I answer Catherine Livingston's question? Yeah, let me just uh, read it out loud, Catherine, um, so that others know what the question is. So Catherine Livingston has asked, how do we work with core groups like the mental health sector, income sources, ETC, to work within these models when their funding is from provincial funding sources um, or other non-regional sources that have mandates and service requirements assist us? So maybe I can give a kick at that one. And uh, it's a very thoughtful question, Catherine, and it has ramifications for us, as you, as you pointed out. No, we don't work in isolation. People in mental health and people in, in the hospital and people in the community health centers, they, we, we can't work in isolation. And in the past, we've always tried to work, I hate that word silos, but we know what that means. We solve our own problems, not realizing that the person crosses all of these sectors that we're serving. So we're working, uh, the, the um, Niagara Connect, which is really the community of Niagara, is working on a number of different projects. For example, building a mental health charter, and some of you are aware of that, or working on, um, what other ones are we working on? The, the access to services? Yes, getting, 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 their getting, pe getting their project, which is getting people to their appointments, whether they're health appointments, or whether they're social services appointments, or employment uh, services. And so the same person-centered model is going to emerge, whether people like it or not, <laughs> in, uh, in that way because we're all talking about it. So the same model will affect people through each of these different sectors. So over a period of two to three years, we'll all be talking from the same song sheet in term because the common denominator is the people who service these people. The second common denominator, if you can have two common denominators, is that we'll be using the knowledge change. And as, as you begin your practice talk uh, work and you're working as communities of practice, that actually inoculates the whole community and it inoculates other sectors besides the one we're working in. So by, um, it's just uh, the technical part of it is all called complexity in community and there are ways to make it happen. And that's the part that the Niagara Connects, Mary and I can help you with your work. The other good example, Mary here, the other good example is the, the work of the Niagara Age-Friendly Community Initiative and that project is actually winding down. It's been a three-year project but emerging out of that is a call to create a senior strategy for Niagara and um, that actually also, um, there's a lot of elements of this person-centered um, service delivery that can definitely apply there. So. All of this work that we're doing, we, we need to give ourselves, um, um, you know, uh, give ourselves a break. We're pioneering something here, but um, as we work on it together and figure it out together, um, we're going to be setting up a model that can apply to a lot of our other work. So there's overlap between a lot of this work. So um, now there's a, another question I see about practice talk. If uh, Sarah would yeah, like to. Yeah, Christine has asked after the practice talk sessions, where does the information go? Great question. So, um, if for those of you who attended the initial forum on October 18th, Dr. Parbu Singh, the facilitator who uh, helped us to learn about practice talk, um, if you recall, he actually played an MP3 file that was, I believe it was a nurse, a healthcare worker in Alberta. And um, she called into, they had a special 1-800 number set up where people could call in with their thoughts and reflections after a practice talk session and they could record it. And then it went into an accessible format that other people could access online. So I know as a group of practice talk leaders, we've had this discussion, um, you know, how can we set up a format to, um, capture that information that we discussed about best practices 
So I believe that that's where the knowledge exchange comes in, and um, there, there will be the capacity there to build um, a room, if you will, or a space um, attached to the knowledge exchange for um, these practice talk ideas to be either recorded in a, in a written format. Um, we can decide on what our, our common or best practice is as practice talk groups. We can come up with some solutions, or it could be by, again, doing a voice recording. So those, the technology will allow us to park those ideas in a safe, accessible spot, and the work of the knowledge broker with the knowledge exchange will help to curate that or keep it in a safe spot so that it's accessible. So I think we have solutions. We just need to describe as, um, as a group how we want that um, information to be gathered and, uh, and utilized. Yeah, utilized so that it's of use, so that we're not losing that, those great ideas that came forward. The idea is not to, uh, is to keep archive it and keep building on our, uh, our good work. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments or reactions? to the model? Does it, does it resonate with people? Do you, as, as Mary and Catherine and I were, were talking about the different components, um, could you see how it could be applied within your own work setting as a framework for you going forward? Um, I'd love to hear some feedback, Mary, here about um, if you think that the model makes sense or do you need some time to just digest the information and think about it? Um, any feedback you have would be great. I, I just see way too many challenges. And, and I think too, in particular, I'd love to hear about if anyone sees any challenges. Mm -hmm. um, if, if as we're talking through this model, if there's any red flags that are being raised or any, any components that give you pause, um, like what we've heard with connecting to other groups that have different types of funding, that kind of thing. What are some other challenges that might come up as we move ahead with this work together? And just a reminder, you can unmute your phone line by pressing star seven. So maybe here's another way to pose the question. Does, does this organization of the ideas and really your thoughts and ideas, this theming, and this uh, model that we've advanced, does it, is it real? Does it make sense to you? Is, are there any red flags there or um, barriers that you see um, to this potentially working for us? Does it make sense at a practical level? Bev, just a great comment, Bev. It does make sense. We've been applying these ideas without even realizing it's related to the model. Um, as community developers, I think, um, we do this naturally, um, but it's great to have a model to relate to. Uh, and that's a great point, Bev. A, a lot of times when we talk to people about this ty these type of concepts, it's the same reaction. You know, well, we were already doing that. It's just this gives you a framework to do it in a more deliberate way. And one of the benefits, this is Catherine, one of the benefits of having the framework is that it actually allows us to measure, or those shared measures, of where we're going and how we're getting there. Because sometimes we work away at our work and we don't know that we're achieving success. We just keep doing it because it seems to work. And when I look at um, the framework and I look at where we are and where we were when uh, the commissioners came for the social assistance review, we've come miles in our success. You've come miles in your success in terms of creating a common approach and even just gathering together. Hello, Catherine and Mary. It's Jennifer here. I just wanted to make a comment about the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that language is always a difficulty. I, I think a lot of people are involved in person-centered um, service, but we, we use different words to describe what we're doing. And I think that some of the challenge will be getting agreement on what we see as the model is. I think a lot of us are doing it. One of the things that came up when we were doing the putting the pieces together was the problem that um, we might be using person-centered um, behaviors and best practices with our clients, but we're not necessarily always doing it with our colleagues. 
So part of developing the model is looking at how we treat our colleagues as well as how we treat our, our, our uh, clients. So I think language and how we define what we're talking about is person-centered and coming to an agreement, that might be a challenge. And then to broaden it, say it's not just about the client, it's also about the whole community of us working together and how we treat each other. A good point, said Jennifer. That's a very good point. And that did, did come out that, um, uh, yes, yeah, some of that work um, needs to be just on how we relate to each other. And also, Jennifer, the more we come together, the more you know a person, the more trust you have, the, the easier it is to pick up the phone and talk to them. I think that just, just coming together makes a big difference, might make a big difference. Well, I think the communities of practice are going to um, help that make that happen. I was just going to say that within the legal within the legal clinics, we we have a series of communities of practice. Most of ours are all online because we're you know throughout the province. But we do have share these common ideas, and we do these things, and it, and it's and we have lively discussions from time to time on peer, things that come up, and and they're very useful. They're very helpful when we're, we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. So I, I think once these communities of practice get up and running, people will find them very valuable because they're extremely helpful. Well, even so, Jennifer, to augment what you're saying or to reinforce that is that when we uh, start developing our maps, which is not a difficult thing to do, we're going to see how strong we are in Niagara. We don't have to, as you say, start from scratch. We have these communities of practice. I just don't think many of them we're aware of. And so putting them on a map will help each of us see, in fact, Niagara's strengths. And accessing them. I, I like in-person meetings as much as the next person. I think they're really important. But as our time gets squeezed, sometimes the only way we can meet is, is online or, or you know, on a teleconference or something like that. You find that sometimes for these quick questions, oh, what do you do when this happens? And you throw it out to your community to practice, and you get six ideas back in the space of 10 minutes. It's, it's a great tool, and it's something that's really, really helpful. You don't have to wait for the next meeting in two weeks or something. Exactly. Right. I, it's interesting. I see that Ruth Ann uh, Brown um, has made a couple of comments here that the model makes sense. And the issue moving forward will be the staffing capacity of each agency and the region's geography. So we will need to be able to look at different ways to meet to provide person-centered service. So um, yeah, this, this issue of, uh, we've heard several times that geography is a determinant of health in Niagara. So that's, this is making me think of that. And, and that's why whatever model we work on together um, will be through the Niagara lens because we know our community, um, uh, we know our um, uh, assets, we also know our community leaders, our clients, and we know our fellow workers. Uh, so we can build a model that makes sense for our work here. Definitely, and using, um, like we just heard, using technology when appropriate to help you span those geographical differences. Um, so technology like this that can be used not only for presentations, but even to, to help your COP, your community to practice, or, or project group agendas even, you know, um, where to date a lot of times we've relied on just teleconference, which, which works great, um, but also using technology like this where you can then have the visual aspect as well to help you do your work in a little bit in a little bit of a different way. Right. So it'll be interesting to hear folks some um, ideas about about uh, how they've enjoyed uh, this way of exchanging information too in terms of utilizing the webinar um, technology. I'll be curious to hear that. Yeah, that's a good point, Mary. And actually, we do have some evaluation questions um, at the end of the session just before you leave today. But when you do close your web browser, there's an opportunity to provide additional comments. And uh, I would encourage you there, please do feedback to us in terms of um, how your experience was today using this technology. Uh, Melanie says, I know this is not really controllable, but there's a lot of changeover in staff. So it would be something that we would need to think of as people get replaced and moved around. Definitely, Melanie. And I think about that in terms of, of the network as a whole even, that when new people come in, when you look at that map, 
how do we make sure that, that they're getting those same connections, that they're, that they're replacing the dot, the person that um, has left, and how do we make sure that those um, relationships are transitioned as well so that they remain a strong part of, or they're inserted into a strong community. And the, and the positive then is uh, that new person then brings in new and different information possibly. Exactly. And also because we're a net, we will be a stronger network as time goes on and we are now, moving to the next agency just helps inoculate the next agency. That's right. My fancy words, but all it means is you take the idea to the next place. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Catherine. So I do see we're just coming up on our time already today. It flew by. Um, but I did want to take a minute to pause and uh, share with you that additional information about uh, the next forum, which will be an in-person on April 17th from 8 to 7.30 at the Welland Community Wellness Complex. Um, and we will be hearing then from uh, Chris Ackley about person-centered thinking in Niagara. So, Hopefully that will also help further this conversation that we've had today around that person-centered lens. And I love the comments about how do we apply that not only to clients but to each other and to how we work with our colleagues because, because we're really focused on that interprofessional care, intersectoral care across organizations um, and partnerships. But, but I think sometimes we lose taking the, the person-centered lens to that level as well. Um, and certainly this will be an opportunity to collaborate with your colleagues to advance this model that we've talked about today and to begin building a measurement tool for collective action, which will be, uh, which will be exciting as well. So as I said, the invitation for that will come out later today uh, with the registration details. Um, I don't believe there's a cost to attend, but we do ask that you um, click on the link and register for the event so that we can anticipate um, our numbers in terms of who's coming. So before we sign off today, um, I'd like to just take a minute. We've got four quick poll questions. If you can uh, take a second and answer the question on the screen there. This one's in terms of quality information. Um, and once I see we've got most of the answers, we'll move on to the next one. But this helps us continue as we go forward to not only to use this technology, but to do these type of events, webinars, um, make sure that we're tailoring the information to best meet your needs. And if you are joining from a group, um, just you can just choose based on the general consensus of your group. That's fine. Yeah, we're, 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 we're and I do hear some people talking um, in the background, which is great, and we're fine with that. Um, I do always pipe in just in case you're having any private conversations you don't want anyone hearing. Uh, so if you would like to mute your phone, you can do so by pressing star six. Is it us that you can hear? Are you talking about us? <laughs> we can hear Rick. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think it was me. I'm here by myself. Oh, what? I wonder. Well, no. <laughs> I thought it was you. <laughs> I don't know how to unmute it. <laughs> Seriously, how do I unmute it? Does anybody know? Uh, to make it so we don't hear you? Yeah. Uh, to mute it, it's star, it's star seven, isn't it, Sarah? No, no muting, muting it so we don't hear you is star six. six. Okay. <laughs> now you won't hear me, but I don't think you heard me before. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll move us to the next question. And while we're just wrapping up the last couple questions, um, as I see it is 10 o'clock and I know people, we have very busy lives and it's often from one meeting to the next. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank each of you for joining us and for taking the time to contribute and participate today um, and, and partake in, in using the webinar technology, especially if this was your first time. And a special thank you as well to, uh, to our presenters, Mary and Catherine. Um, and, and Catherine, uh, congratulations on your first uh, webinar experience. As well. <laughs> I didn't goof it up. <laughs> oh, you did fantastic. So uh, <laughs> thank that. you, Sarah. And thanks yeah. to everyone for attending. This has been great, in my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs>
Perfect, perfect. So this is the last question. Other than that, um, we'll sign off here. Thank you to everyone and um, best of luck to those that are participating in practice talk sessions um, following this webinar. We certainly are interested to hear how they go um, and we'll stay connected with you going forward. And other than that, please don't hesitate to reach out if you, to Mary, Catherine, or myself if you have any questions, further questions, you know, as you think about this work. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, through email. Um, but other than that, that's all. So thank you very much. And we will be speaking with all of you shortly. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.